evening. evening. Welcome to St. Paul. It's great to be able to gather together and worship on this Festival of the Reformation weekend. Uh, Really excited to have seminarian Caleb Strutz with us today. Caleb is going to seminary at Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary, and he is also the resident assistant over at the Beacon Campus Ministry. So we're working together a lot in our ministry, especially focused on college students, too. So, yeah, really glad to have you here. Thanks for being here today. Uh, As we celebrate the Reformation, we start with um, Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, hymn 201. The words will be on the screen. You can also look up the music in the red hymnal. And when it gets to verse 4, if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for verse 4. God's blessings as we worship together.
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. His blood sets us free to be the people of God. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am troubled and repentant sinner. Confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me, and I am deeply sorry for them. Jesus' death paid the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. He said to his people, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. For the Lord, the righteous judge, has laid up for us a crown of life. For us, and for all who await to appear. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them, them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is from the book of Jeremiah, the 11th chapter. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and will not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good thing I had intended to do for it. Now therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. The word of the Lord. We continue with the psalm of the day.
second lesson is from the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Alleluia. We continue with the sermon here. from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text today is also the gospel lesson appointed for the festival of the Reformation, Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 5. Jesus said to them, his disciples, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. The gospel of our Lord. We're starting a new series, a new season of the church year. The season of the church year is called End Times. Focuses us on the things to come at the end, and Jesus speaks to his disciples, and he tells them what to expect at the end of time. Now, if we're thinking about the end and knowing what's at the end, that doesn't sound like something we always want to know. I don't grab a new book from the library and flip to the last chapter and read through that first to see if it's worth my time. I know some people who do that. Uh, if, if there's a TV series or something like that that I'm watching 
and there are spoilers that could be coming in later episodes, but I haven't gotten to them yet. I don't want somebody to tell me about what's coming up next. Maybe you used to have a VCR or something like that, uh, if you remember that technology. My dad used to, you know, be in a church on Sundays. Sometimes he'd record a football game that started a little bit earlier, but he wouldn't want anybody to tell him what happened. He wanted to go back and be able to watch it for the first time. You don't want to lose the surprise by knowing what the end is. Well, in God's Word, in the Bible, God, he, he gives us a spoiler. He tells us what the end is going to be like, not so that we lose the surprise, but so that we're prepared and we can be encouraged as we know how all of this ends. Because if we didn't know, it would probably seem a lot of times like things are just completely out of control, that God doesn't know what's going on. He, he must have lost sight of us and this world because things are just seeming to spin in crazy ways. But Jesus tells us he knows exactly what's going on. He knows how this ends, and he prepares us for the difficult things that lead up to a wonderful end. On this Reformation Day, Jesus makes, us clear, makes it clear that the end is near. For every generation of Christians, be ready, it's near, but don't worry. Because Jesus gives us the faith, the persistence, the endurance to stand firm until the end. That's what he does today. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the end. It's Tuesday of Holy Week, just a few days before Jesus is going to go to the cross. This is his last time when he's inside of the temple before Jesus leaves this area for the rest of his ministry. His disciples have just seen the temple and they said, what an amazing building this is. And Jesus lets them know at one time, these huge, massive stones making up the temple building, they're not going to be stacked one on top of another. Because in 70 AD, the Romans would come and they would tear it down. They would devastate the temple. And the disciples say, wait a second, what? All, all this coming at the end, when is this going to happen? And what are the signs of your coming again? What are the signs we should watch for? So Jesus prepares them, and here he also is including the time when he will come again in glory on Judgment Day. So he says things like, watch out so that no one deceives you. Watch out for false teachers. There have been and there will continue to be people coming into this world, uh, claiming the authority and the power of God himself, acting like they are the Messiah, coming in and, and telling you things that are deceitful. Watch out for them. Don't get duped. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. And you might look and you see horrible things happening with wars and think, oh no, it's the end now. But no, it's just a sign that the end is coming. God's still got it under control. He holds the nations in his hand. The disciples should be ready for natural signs, natural disasters, earthquakes, and famine. These are pictures reminding us that the end is coming. There's going to be opposition and persecution for them because of Christ. They should be expected to be handed over to councils and flogged in synagogues. So within their own people, within, among the believers, the Jewish people, they'll be handed over. And among the Romans and the Gentiles, they'll appear before kings and governors and witness before them and also be persecuted. So get ready for this. It will happen because you follow Jesus and you follow his path of suffering. And it did happen. Most of the disciples, other than the Apostle John, were killed for their faith. Because they refused to let go of the promise that Jesus really died and really came, became alive again. And they were willing to die because they knew that they had an eternal home in heaven waiting for them. You think about just a couple of examples of this prophecy coming true. We have in the beginning of Acts the Apostle Stephen, who is stoned before the, the Sanhedrin, before the Jewish people for being a Christian. And then over and over toward the end of the book of Acts, we have the Apostle Paul standing before kings, making a proclamation, being filled with the Spirit, just like Jesus promised that they would be. And then there's also these promises. As all this is going on, this is not, this will not be a distraction to God's people so that they go and run and hide. Instead, 
the gospel will be, must be, first preached to all nations. Wouldn't it be better to hide, hide out, to blend in, to give up? No. God is going to use even this resistance to spur on even more intense, have even more intense focus on mission work. And when you go on trial, and you will, the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what to say. This weekend is the Festival of the Reformation. 500 years ago, this year, Martin Luther knew these warnings and these promises too. And Martin Luther fulfilled these warnings and these promises too. Jesus said to watch out for people deceiving, and Martin Luther saw his own church deceiving people, claiming the very authority of Christ and teaching things that were not from the Bible. He knew from reading what God's word says that Jesus had won complete forgiveness for the entire world by his substitutionary death on the cross, that Jesus had given his righteous life as a gift to every man, woman, and child on this earth. Yet the church was teaching that people still had to partially, at least, pay their own way to be able to get to heaven. They were going out and they were making money by selling these indulgences that said people could pay money and then they could get years and years off for themselves or their family members from this imaginary place they called purgatory, where you could go and suffer for your sins a little bit longer before being fully cleansed and able to enter heaven. And he said, that is not biblical. That's deception. And they were saying essentially that Jesus' death on the cross was insufficient for actually paying for our sins. And Martin Luther knew from his study of God's word that if anything still depends on me for my salvation, then there can be no true certainty. And God wants us to be certain from his word to be sure that we are truly saved by grace through faith alone, not by ourselves, not by our works, so that there's nothing, no boasting that we can do. Righteousness came as a gift from God through Jesus, received by faith. Jesus had warned his disciples right here that false teachers would come, claiming to have Christ's authority. So don't be deceived. And for the first years of his life, Martin Luther was deceived, like most other people were too. He realized that when he was reading and teaching God's word. So then he wrote about it. <laughs> then, then through the printing press, he started getting God's word out to the people, and the Catholic Church of his time <laughs> took notice and became upset about it, and then continued to fulfill this prophecy from God's word. In, 19, in, in 1520, the Pope issued a, a papal bull, an official pronouncement, that charged Martin Luther with 41 instances of deviation from the teaching and practice of the church and ordered him to recant or retract his teaching within 60 days or suffer excommunication. You're no longer part of the church. You're a false teacher. You're on the way to hell. So 500 years ago, this year, 1521, Luther was brought to trial at the Diet of Worms. Um, not, not talking about a diet of eating a lot of worms, but a diet is an official meeting of the Holy Roman Emperor himself. They were working on a bunch of different uh, uh, things. Luther was on the agenda. They were going to address him, and it was in a German city called Worms. And they were meeting him, and they gave Luther the time to come and show up and be able to speak about what he had written and to be able to recant or retract what he had written so he wouldn't be excommunicated. And Martin Luther showed up there at 4 o'clock on, uh, I believe it was on, on the Sunday when he had his first appeal in April. And he thought maybe he'd be able to have a conversation about this and talk through some of the things he had written. But when he got there, he was asked, Two questions. 
A, a man named Johann Eck pointed to a table that had 25 books on it and writings. And he said, are these your writings? And will you recant, retract what you have written? And filled with the Holy Spirit, Martin Luther valiantly said, uh, can you give me a day before I reply on this? And they said, yes, come back tomorrow and, and we'll handle this. So imagine Martin Luther that night. Just going through, knowing he is about to be removed from the church if he says, yes, and I will not recant. Could it be that, that he had it right and that the entire world at the time had it wrong? But he thought about his study of scripture and what God's word had said. And he came to a conclusion and he showed up the next day, 500 years ago, 1521. The grace of Jesus is free. We're not saved from our works. True biblical teaching can only come from the Bible, not through popes and councils that contradict themselves and contradict Scripture. Grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. So the next day he arrived, and the same questions were asked. And he answered the question, Yes, these are my writings. But can I retract, can I recant all of them? That, that just doesn't logically make sense. There's different kinds of writings here. Some of these writings, some of my enemies have even said, these are good and helpful writings. That they, they teach what the Bible says. How could I say I reject and take back those? None of us would agree with that. Other things that I have written are going against abuses that are happening within the church right now. And if I would take those back, then it would just be saying, go ahead and continue these flagrant abuses. And, and the last ones are especially about uh, people, individuals, and yeah, I used some harsh language. And for that, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have spoken so forcefully. But as for the substance of what was actually written in these writings, I can't take that back because that lands squarely on Scripture. And it would go against my conscience to be able to say that that is not true. And, and eventually, Johann X said, enough, just give us a straight answer. Do you recant or do you not? To which Luther responded, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures, I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Holy Spirit kept the promise that Jesus made and gave him words and courage to speak in front of kings and governors, in front of church. And even though he would now become a man that could be arrested and killed as a heretic, a false teacher, Luther spoke words given to him through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and it didn't result in him getting acquitted or declared innocent by the Holy Roman Emperor. But God did already acquit him and declare him innocent by the death of Jesus for forgiving all of his sins, so he knew that no matter what happened, people couldn't actually touch him or his soul because of the full and free forgiveness that Jesus won for us on the cross. No matter what happened, God would also keep his promise that the gospel must be preached to all nations. And friends, we are evidence of God keeping that promise too. Even through Martin Luther, who was not killed, but he went on for years to continue to clearly proclaim the scriptures. To the end that now, on the other side of the ocean, here we are gathered in a church hearing God's word preached and, and spoken and taught in truth and purity. The gospel continues to be proclaimed. 
to this nation, and to an extent it has been to every nation on the earth. God kept his promises, even in these dangerous end times. So these predictions and promises that Jesus made were true for his disciples. They were true 1,500 years later for Martin Luther, and 2,000 years they are still true for us. So we can find comfort and courage in what Jesus promises at the end of the story. Not fear or trepidation, but we can listen to these things too. Where Jesus also calls us to stand firm. He tells us too to watch out that no one deceives you. Because even today, there will be people acting a lot like Christians, standing in the place of Christ, who will try to deceive you. So know God's word, hear God's word, study God's word, and stand firm on his word, on his mission of going and spreading the gospel to all nations on earth, relying on Jesus. Not just standing firm on what you are passionate about, or, or standing firm on the parts of God's word that make you feel most comfortable, but standing on all of God's word and what he actually says. You can find churches out there and Christians out there who will tell you that you don't have to change. But change is a part of the Christian life, repenting and changing and focusing back again on Jesus. Our sinful nature looks for ways that we can rely on ourselves instead of the free forgiveness that Jesus gives to us. But don't be deceived. Know what God's word says. And know what Jesus himself has done. We also will see things that Jesus predicted. Wars and famines. That's not the end. God is still in control. There will be, and we know, pestilence, viruses, wars, nuclear disaster, climate change. Those things won't be the end of the world. They won't be. God is in control of when the end of the world comes. And when he does, Jesus is going to come down from heaven on his timing. These are signs to lead us toward repentance and to lead us to recognize Jesus is coming soon. Lord, help me to keep watch. I can't stand firm all the time, though, and neither can you. Think about all the times when we are deceived because we don't know God and his word as well as we should. Think about all the times when even though we've heard that our mission here is to go and spread the gospel to all nations, that even though there's absolutely no danger involved, we shirk back and we don't share the gospel with our friends and family members when we have the opportunity to. Again, we need to go to Christ and find his forgiveness for our sins. His forgiveness so that we can stand firm. And speaking of standing firm, to look back at Jesus and to find Jesus because here is the one who stood firm. So much more so than Martin Luther or than I or than you could do. But Jesus stood firm to the end. Jesus, just days after this, would be put on trial just as he predicted his followers would be. He would be asked under oath who he was. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. And I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming down from the clouds of heaven. And they reacted with anger because he was saying who he was. The Son of God, the one who's coming down from heaven again to judge. And they tore their clothes and said, he is worthy of death. Jesus gave his true confession and it didn't lead to, oh, acquittal, you're innocent, but to his death on the cross. Yet God would judge him innocent when he raised him again from the dead on the third day. And God has judged you innocent when he raised him from the dead on the third day. Sin is paid for. Yes, the end is near. But that's okay. That's good. The final words of scripture are praying for that. Come Lord Jesus. Amen. This isn't a reason to fear. It's a reason to have confidence and commitment as we share the gospel. 
He will stand firm, though the mountains give way and, the, and fall into the heart of the sea. God is with you. He is your fortress. He protects us from attacks, and he prepares us to go out to battle with his word and his promises. And just a verse later, he promises this. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith using the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. We'll continue by bringing the offering plate up to show that this is an offering being given to our Lord. During that time, we'll also watch the Risen Savior Minute and to see an update from our school that we love and support. During that time, take a moment to fill out the connection card, either with a pen down the side aisles or by using the QR code with your smartphone, and then you can drop that off in the basket on the way out. Enjoy the Risen Savior Minute.
have no way to satisfy your righteousness. Nothing can contest the deceiver's earthly power. Nothing can mute his false attractions. Nothing to uproot the rule of our sinful flesh. We would gladly pass our days in happiness and peace in the name of the angel of us with the name of Jesus. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the cause is yours. Yes, creator of all that is, your cause is righteous and everlasting. Vindicate your name among the nations. O all seeing Lord, have mercy on your church. You understand our plight. We thank you for sending a messenger of peace to correct the times between life and death. This, is, this one is your Son, Jesus the Christ, the incarnate Savior, who saves us from calamity that plague your church. You have chosen us to do your work. Therefore,
bring you a little update for some of the things going on at Jesus <laughs> Loves Me Learning Center. So uh, Mrs. Smith put this together so you can just kind of see some of the fun things that we do right here at our Early Learning Center where we're just meeting kids and families from our community, a lot of them that aren't yet connected to a church and working together so that every day being able to share God's word with these kids and then finding more and more opportunities to be able to reach out to families to, um, to share God's word with them. Yeah, working on a bike shop there too. Did a pumpkin patch visit one day over at Lone, Lone Pine Acres, the Stewart's Pumpkin Patch. It's a lot of fun stuff happening in here. St. Paul's has a, a, a bunch of neat ministries. are putting that together. It's good for us to see what is going on at our, our early learning center. Thinking of that, um, I have a handful of announcements from here, and one of them, I guess, is on the second page in the announcements section, um, call meeting things. So there'll be, there'll be more conversation about this at the open forum tomorrow after the second service at 1130. Um, but I guess the high-level things are there. We're going to meet... Um, it sounds like we're going to be able to do November 14th. I have written on there 1 p.m. Sounds like we might be able to do 12 noon. So maybe you can just adjust that if you're watching at home. 12 noon is what it seems like it's going to work for our district president, Pastor Platt, to be able to come and lead that call meeting. It's going to be kind of a call of palooza. We're going to be uh, extending a call for a vacancy pastor to be able to come out and help. Um, we're going to be looking probably for a visitation pastor, but that might happen a little bit after. Uh, we are going to be extending a call for a lead, a permanent lead pastor. And then we could have as many as three calls for Jesus Loves Me Learning Center teachers. Um, it's been really nice being close to MLC, where we've been able to have the, the people who are able to be there for one year or even two years, maybe while a husband is finishing up MLC and they're not ready to go over to seminary yet or something like that. Um, but we're coming to the point where we need three more people for next year. So we want to invite everybody to come to that and, uh, and take part in that, in that call meeting to give advice and be part of that process. And then our voting members will issue the calls on that day. So ask me any questions afterward if you've got questions about that. Um, also then, we have MVL uh, Christmas wreaths are being sold in the back. So we've got some high schoolers, or at least a high schooler back there, selling those to get ready for Christmas. Um, Festival of the Reformation, really neat opportunity to go to Martin Luther College, the Chapel of the Christ, at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon for uh, a special area Reformation service. And then um, next week, we're going to have a kind of special different worship service. Staff Minister Mike Westendorf from Wisconsin does a lot with campus ministries and then other and congregations too, kind of a worship staff minister. So he's going to be leading worship, kind of having a devotional aspects to the worship service. We'll have the Lord's Supper at the beginning of the service, and, and then um, he'll be leading that one and also talking about ways that we can reach uh, young people, kind of the 18 to 28-year-olds, in that, that, that so often churches kind of lose track of. So excited to come and hear some really, 
really good music and follow this road that Jesus had to the cross for the joy set before him. So that happens next week. Those are my main things. I guess you, you look through, there's a lot of announcements. There's opportunities to support the food shelf on the pink table back there too, the MLC, Martin Luther College Food Shelf. Um, I've been a poor married student at Martin Luther College before. Really great to be able to go in and find some food and stuff like that. So you can donate that. That Sunday school is doing that. Um, Caleb, thank you so much for uh, doing our liturgy, for presiding today. We look forward to talking to you on the way out. Turn around and say hi to the people around you and say good evening to them too.